So in the last class, I gave you uh, contents of this course, the highlights of the course that we're going to look at. And uh, what I want to start uh, with today's class is the following. Uh, look, if you look at the solid state materials, okay, solid state materials uh, come in various forms. I said uh, we have uh, thousands of uh, solid state materials giving rise to various physical properties. You have materials uh, um, with uh, good conductivity, the good conductors, semiconductors, insulators, magnetic systems. You also have uh, uh, materials giving rise to piezo properties, dielectrics, transparency, transparent conducting systems. Uh, I also mentioned that we are lucky that all these uh, hundreds of thousand systems, they crystallize into seven crystal forms only. Seven crystal forms, and uh, sir, yeah, sir. One student is saying in WhatsApp that he can't join. That's that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That don't don't worry. It's, uh, one of the so so all these materials uh, crystallize into seven crystal forms, and also uh, fourteen Bravais lattices. And your solid state materials showing uh, having uh, ionic, covalent, and metallic bonds, Van der Waals type of bonding, Van der Waals and uh, hydrogen bonding is, you know, is, uh, uh, is a weakly coupled systems. Um, so you have optically reflective transparent systems, materials with mechanical properties. And you see on the right hand side, uh, uh, bottom, I've written three categories of systems, or four rather. If you take alloys and intermetallics as one category, so you start with alloys, intermetallics, metals, and uh, ceramics. Metals, alloys, intermetallics, and ceramics. You can actually combine metals and alloys into one category. Uh, you all know that. An alloy is a combination of uh, two or three or more elements. Intermetallic is uh, special in the sense that uh, it's a it's a, comp a combination of a few elements with a specific composition. And a ceramic is also is a system or a material with a specific composition giving rise to uh, a, a given property. So I have a doubt here. Yeah. Um, so so we um, kind of categorize materials as crystalline, non-crystalline. But yes. I mean, um, so like the middle segment here, which is like metallic, ionic, covalent. But I mean, they could also exhibit either crystalline or non-crystalline, right? Exactly. Is that like exactly? That's what I'm coming to. Uh, so I told you in the in the first class that uh, you just take a simple example of uh, silicon. Okay. Um, Silicon, we know, is a semiconductor. You can increase its conductivity by doping. You can make it into a P-type and N-type semiconductor. So that silicon, even it, in its pure form, can exist in crystalline and non-crystalline form. So that's what I, I started saying that, um, how would the properties be affected if the same material is obtained in different forms? You also have one more category that, that is uh, the polycrystalline form. In a similar way, if you come down here, the ceramics that the first category you see, first of all, you need to know what is a ceramic and uh, um, in, you know, how uh, a, a ceramic is defined. Uh, a, a ceramic can be in a thin film form, in a crystalline form, in a non-crystalline form, and a polycrystalline form. So if I, I'll come back to this, but if I write this down, let's see. Let me take uh, the slide, right? So, yeah. 
see this now. So if I start talking about solid state materials, so you have the, you have them in in the, in the crystalline form. You also have them in a in polycrystalline form. and non-crystalline form. So that means a single material can be in all these forms. Yeah. Now, So a polycrystalline material, a polycrystalline form, crystalline form, and non-crystalline form. So if you take, uh, uh, say, thin films, it means I, I obtain the thin film form of a solid state material. This can be, again, in, a, in, in, in crystalline form in polycrystalline form and amorphose form. See? Now I can also get these solid state materials, you know? I can get these solid state materials in uh, nano form, in nanoparticle form. And even in the nano form, I can have them in all, in all these three categories. Now you see the number of combinations you have. But in this course, our main interest is in films. And what happens, first of all, if they are obtained in three different forms? This is going to be very interesting because you see, which means I just start with a simple example of silicon. I can have silicon in all these three forms. So when you obtain silicon in all these three forms, what happens to its bulk physical properties? Remember I, I mentioned in the first class that, uh, uh, you know, materials obtained in crystalline form is what is required when I'm thinking of uh, doing authentic physical property studies or for device applications. But I also mentioned that it is always easy to get materials in single crystalline form, uh, in, in, in polycrystalline form. It's not easy to grow materials in single crystalline form. Just a minute. I just want to know why this is Yeah, there's people still asking me to admit them. It would be nice if all of them log in on time, you know? All right, no problem. Just a minute. Okay. All right. So so now what happens if I, if you if you take silicon, which is a uh, perfect example of a semiconductor. If I get it in one of these three forms, what do you expect, you know? Will it's a, a crystalline form change? Will the physical properties uh, change? Are the physical properties affected? The bulk properties, you know? Remember I also mentioned that uh, every system has uh, bulk properties, you know? Electrical conduction, thermal conductivity, specific heat, these are all bulk properties. In, in, when we're talking about semiconductors, even uh, the band gap is a bulk property. So you don't expect the band gap to uh, change, for example, as a function of uh, size. But of course, when you go down to the nano form, you'll start seeing the bulk properties getting affected. That, that's a whole 
science of uh, small, no? The nanoscience is all about why the bulk properties change when you go down to the nanoscale level. Well, thin films in one way, if, you, if I get a thin film, uh, which I call it the ultra thin film, where the, the thickness of the thin film is uh, a few angstroms or a few nanometers, so it becomes one of the nanoforms, right? So in nanoform compared to the three-dimensional bulk material, I have the three-dimensional bulk form reduced into a two-dimensional form where one of the dimensions is in the nanoform. So the example there is a thin film. So the first example of the first form of a nanomaterial, uh, which is uh, the two-dimensional form of uh, any nanosystem, the thin film is an example. So that means uh, uh, if you drive one of the dimensions, if the thickness is within the nanoscale regime, you ought to see physical property changes along that direction. So that's why uh, ultra thin films giving rise to quantum confinement effects in 2D form is a beautiful example of a 2D material. So that the, those thin films that start showing the uh, quantum effects, quantum confinement effects, they're called quantum wells. So thin films are the best examples of uh, quantum wells. Then you have uh, one dimensional nano rods also, nano wires. Nano wires also in one way are a subset of uh, thin films, right? You can actually grow them in a nano wire form or fabricate them from a regular uh, thin film. You know, if you know about, probably I'll give an example of how to obtain a, 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 a nano strip or a nano wire out of a, a regularly grown thin film on a substrate. This you use normally uh, lithography. You need to go down to electron lithography level to get these uh, nano viscous and nano fibers, uh, nano strips of uh, uh, one dimensional systems. Right? So both uh, 2D and 1D uh, systems can be derived from a regular thin film. Then you have a, a zero dimensional uh, nanoform where uh, the confinement is in all three dimensions. Uh, this kind of confinement, you can see particles prepared by chemical methods or again by growing uh, zero dimensional particles using thin film growth methods. So, uh, so the, the, the three nanoforms that we talk about, the 2D, 1D and zero dimension systems, all can be up, obtained by the thin film growth methods. Today, uh, you know, you, we, we can get zero dimensional quantum dots using uh, chemical processes, but then the quantum dots obtained by way of uh, using uh, thin film deposition techniques, either PVD or uh, CVD, are much more cleaner. And, and then you can get them in a, in a sort of an orderly form for uh, various photonic device applications. Okay. But the big question is, what happens if I take a material um, uh, in, in different forms. You know, crystalline form is what is always required. I also said that polycrystalline form is the easiest form to get. And uh, well, materials in, in amorphous form are also required for certain applications. You need not uh, always think that, oh, if it is not crystalline, that it's, it's, it's not going to have any useful applications. No. One of the best applications is you have, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, glass, which is nothing but silicon dioxide, uh, uh, the, 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 the glassy form, the non-crystalline form of silicon dioxide is glass. The crystalline form of uh, silicon dioxide is uh, quartz. Both have tremendous applications on, on, on either side of the spectrum. But, but before we, we, we further proceed to see some examples, you actually need to see what are these different categories, no? what, you, what, what are listed here. Uh, okay. So alloys, we, metals we know, and a combination of one or two metals, like iron and cobalt. If you take iron and cobalt and fuse them together, you get iron cobalt alloy. And, and uh, in that process, I can also vary the concentration of iron and uh, cobalt all the way from 95% uh, here to 5% there, and I can reverse it from 5 to 95. It, it is still an alloy. So these are called solid solutions, right? Something like this. So, uh, 
let's uh, yeah. So we have uh, <coughs> two x. So I can vary x from zero to one. That is what is meant by uh, you know creating solid solutions. This is how a typical alloy is made. There are, there are structural similarities because uh, you, you're choosing two elements, which is sort of structurally similar. So you can afford to have a large number of solid solutions. This is to uh, strengthen one of the elements. If one, one element is used for say, some magnetic applications, but in the form of a single element form, it doesn't have a, 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 a proper strength. So you add the other one, so that, that makes it structurally uh, similar. Or you, if you want to tune the, some of the magnetic parameters of iron, uh, the little addition of cobalt and nickel will help. So, so in, in this particular case, you can have large number of solid solutions. But then when you come to an alloy, uh, intermetallic, intermetallics are uh, what are called the line phase components. It means uh, you get a specific property for a specific composition. Example is, I talk about ND2, T14E. Yeah. So this one is a line phase compound because as you can see, this is, the PM stands for permanent magnets. Uh, this is a very common, useful, the most popular material combination used for making permanent magnetic materials, uh, permanent magnetic systems with a, with a certain uh, uh, magnetic energy product. But you need to get niobium, iron, boron in two is to 14 is to one ratio. If you deviate from this, from the ratio of these uh, cationic elements, you will not get the required properties. So that's why uh, intermetallics are called, uh, you know, line phase compounds, line phase. So that means there's only, a, in the phase diagram, only at that particular, only when you hit that particular composition, the pro these properties, the permanent magnetic properties arise. Any deviation, right? You may not see the permanent uh, magnetic property at all. So that is an intermetallic. But then look, here I need to combine iron with cobalt. Here I need to make uh, a combination of niobium, iron and uh, boron in that ratio. Then only I, I so uh, there, there, there is again a, a process involved in bringing these elements together to form new compounds and new alloys. But what about a ceramic? Because in, in, uh, in, in thin film technology, you know, again, uh, uh, ceramics play an important role like metals and alloys and intermetallics. How do you define a ceramic? A ceramic is also something like a line phase compound, like uh, an intermetallic that uh, the example I've given there. So another intermetallic compound I can give an example of, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so. Okay, so another example I can give of an intermetallic case, uh, something like, uh, NB3J. NB stands for niobium, germanium. You make an intermetallic, with this specific three is to one ratio of the two elements, 
then you get a intermetallic with a superconducting transition of 18 Kelvin. Yeah. So you know that a superconductor is so when you measure the resistance or resistivity of this alloy, so it will start showing a, a linear behavior initially, like in the case of a metal, then at a particular temperature, the resistance drops and so that is called the TC. The TC is there. So that means at and below the transition temperature, it remains in the superconducting state. But then superconductivity occurs in this uh, intermetallic only for that this particular ratio. And same is the case with NB3V also. Yeah. So these are beautiful examples of uh, uh, superconductors. In fact, if I get uh, NB3G or NB3 vanadium in in a normal intermetallic form, that is a bulk form. You can also get them in thin film form. I can take uh, NB3V as a target material and, and convert this uh, uh, bulk material into a thin film form, right? So in thin film form, it was shown that these systems can show a maximum of 23 Kelvin. That means an increase in uh, transition temperature from 18 Kelvin to uh, 23 Kelvin. You'll understand why this happens. This is because uh, uh, you, 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 from, from the bulk, when you go to a thin film state, right, the number of defects will be less. So once the number of uh, defects uh, is less, you get the best possible bulk property. And, and, and these, these two intermetallics uh, are a, a classic example of uh, how in thin film form, they give rise to a better bulk property. But then the limit is 23 Kelvin, the upper uh, limit. You can't push it more than uh, 23 Kelvin. So the range uh, uh, of uh, uh, these two intermetallics, NB3G and NB3V, uh, either in bulk form, bulk intermetallic form, or thin film intermetallic form, in thin film also it is an intermetallic, is from 18 to 23 K. Okay. Now, so what is a ceramic? So a ceramic is also something like uh, this compound, these compounds rather, line phase compounds. That means uh, yeah, uh, it's a combination of, well, ceramics are made of uh, oxides, nitrides, carbides, sulfides, etc. That means in addition to these uh, 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 metallic elements, uh, you have a ceramic with uh, that, 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 that will have oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and sulfur in its lattice. So you, you can give some famous examples of silicon carbide, zinc oxide, hafnium dioxide, and so on. Hundreds of them, you can, hundreds of examples you can give. Gallium nitride, of course. Okay. Uh, one of the very, un so by definition, by definition, a ceramic is, of course, now you, we know that it's a, a metal is a metal. Metals are always conducting. They're good conduct conductors of electricity and, um, uh, and, and alloys, since alloys are also made up of uh, two or three or four individual metallic elements, alloys are also conductors. And since intermetallics are also light phase compounds, but they do not have any of these uh, additional uh, entities, intermetallics are also metallic. So if I make an a, a, a intermetallic composition that shows magnetic properties, that means you see magnetism as well as a metallic property. Okay. But when you come to ceramics, a ceramic by definition is a, um, is an inorganic, it's an inorganic, non-conducting material that is processed at very high temperatures. High temperatures are required. 
Let's say that's the definition. So it's an inorganic material and it's also non-conducting. And you need, you need very high temperatures to process these materials, you know, silicon carbide and all these materials. Um, but one of the, in addition to all these classic examples, you ask me to give an example of a, a, a ceramic that shows conducting properties. I will write this as a great example because we will also be seeing a lot of this material when we talk about the thin film growth process um, and um, you know what is meant by orientation, what is meant by anisotropy with respect to a given physical property. I think for all that, you can just take yttrium barium copper oxide as a classic example, right? Even the structural aspects, how complex the structure is, uh, this encompasses everything. When uh, look, I, I mentioned that today we, we are in a position to get uh, uh, a one single monolayer. That means one single unit cell of any of these systems. You know, when I'm talking about the thin film of NB3V, niob niobium vanadium vanadate. Uh, it's not a vanadate. Vanadate means it's a uh, a ceramic, niobium, vanadium uh, intermetallic, I can obtain in a thin film form and show superconductivity, right? So whether I'm in a position to grow one unit cells of NB3 is always a question and a challenge. In a similar way, when I talk about yttrium barium copper oxide, right, which has a very complex uh, crystal structure, one of the most complex crystal structures, so can I grow yttrium barium copper oxide into one single unit cell, one monolayer and such? These are all challenges. Then what is meant by an isentropy with respect to a given physical property? All that can be understood if you uh, go through this example of yttrium barium copper oxide. That's why I, I, I like uh, citing this one. Well, so by definition, a ceramic is an inorganic, non-conducting, material that is synthesized at very high temperatures. And when you go by the normal ceramic synthesis process, it is called the solid state uh, reaction route, right? Where you start with individual powders uh, and, and then you, you, you initially um, uh, heat these powders at a higher temperature. So the individual bonds are broken. And uh, of course, before you do that, you, you need to go, to the, go through the thermodynamic uh, phase diagrams to see whether a certain reaction is uh, feasible between two different uh, um, entities before to get a final one. A plus B is C you want. If C is the yttrium barium copper oxide, you, you, your starting compositions are uh, derivatives of yttrium, barium, and copper. So your phase diagram should allow you and should tell you that, yes, indeed, at this pressure, at this temperature, uh, uh, if you make a reaction to happen between three different composition uh, entities of yttrium, which is yttrium oxide, barium, barium oxide or barium co uh, carbonate, or copper in the form of carbon, uh, uh, copper oxide, at what temperature a reaction would make it this new phase to form? And what temperature is required? What pressure is required? What is a, how you deal with the O7 on the right side? The oxygen plays a very crucial role, right? This example, I mean, if you understand this system, uh, you, you, you understand a lot of uh, physical properties of uh, solid state materials. It's, it's, an, it's an extraordinary system. You'll realize why. Why I always start with uh, this example, because this comes quite often when we look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, different aspects of thin film growth. So by definition, a ceramic is uh, a, an intermetallic, uh, a, a, an inorganic, non-conducting uh, uh, compound that is uh, synthesized at high temperatures. But then I say yttrium barium copper oxide is also a, sem a superconductor. How is it possible? I can understand when I drew a similar picture for rho versus T, in the previous case, 
in this case where i said uh, these two compositions intermetallic compositions well they the the metals it's natural that uh, uh, conductivity exists it's not a problem all right so the metallic uh, initially and then superconductivity kicks in but then when i'm defining a ceramic as you know inorganic non conducting uh, material and on the right hand side i've given this example silicon carbide of course is uh, in its purest form it's an insulator but zinc oxide most of the oxides are insulators right zinc oxide hafnium dioxide strontium titanate barium titanate uh, if if you want to have uh, 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 you, you know uh, gate oxides gate dielectrics so most of the dielectrics are made of oxides the oxides are all uh, high band gap uh, uh, extremely large band gap system so they're all uh, insulators so these are all best examples of uh, uh, ceramics because they they're, they're inorganic and they're also non conducting but under under the same list of uh, inorganic compounds yeah i have also listed yttrium barium copper oxide yes yttrium barium copper oxide is is yttrium barium copper oxide is is also a a ceramic and by definition it has to be an, it is inorganic of course and it has four important constituents yttrium barium copper and oxygen and which means to start with it is non conducting but then it goes on to show you know a a, a super conducting property this is just amazing how an an insulating compound can uh, uh, show a super conducting behavior it's the same as what you see in the other slide with respect to nb3g except that this ceramic when it becomes uh, a superconductor it shows a transition temperature of about 90 kelvin well so in 1986 when it was discovered <coughs> so until then we had superconductivity seen only in, in conventional materials like nb3g or or uh, um elemental sub, uh, superconductors like uh, of course nb itself is a superconductor vanadium is a superconductor lead is a superconductor aluminum is a superconductor but all these superconducting compositions are elements show superconductivity below at very low temperatures so they they they're all called uh, conventional low temperature elemental superconductors and and uh, the highest superconductivity after these elements was shown by this uh, intermetallic of 23 kelvin then of course the famous uh, bodin cooper schrefer well known bcs theory bodin cooper schrefer uh, they pronounced uh, their theory saying that based on their simple equation 2 delta by kbtc is equal to 3.5 the 3.5 is a magic number they said that you cannot have a superconductor with a transition temperature of more than 35 kelvin and by then what was seen was 23 kelvin in superconducting uh, in uh, 23k superconducting transition in these uh, intermetallic uh, uh, thin films and then after bodin's theory of course scientists always work towards new material uh, finding out uh, trying to find uh, uh, new alloys new intermetallics to see if this these temperatures could be pushed up any further right but it, it was not the case bodin cooper schiffer's the theory remain valid for almost uh, 40 years while the experimental scientific community was toiling to find uh, a superconductor above their predicted temperature of 30 35 kelvin no one could succeed for almost 40 years so this is one of the theories where that remained uh, remained valid for almost uh, four decades and or more then in 1986 this uh, wonderful breakthrough came right the breakthrough in the form of an unconventional material like yttrium barium copper oxide which is a ceramic showing the same kind of 
superconducting behavior that you see in the textbooks. To take uh, uh, Charles Kittel's book, the first beautiful plot of uh, uh, superconducting material is uh, that of uh, mercury. You know, when Kamerling Ones in 1911 succeeded in liquefying uh, uh, helium, because you, you need, uh, 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 you know, cryogenes to go down in temperature. Again, why I'm saying, saying all this is we have relevance when we go and look at physical properties. There is no way you can predict if a, um, if a given system is a semiconductor or a semi-metal or a metal, and if it is a metal, to what extent it's a metal? Is it a good metal or a bad metal? You need to measure this property, resistivity, as a function of temperature. It's not just that you measure a room temperature resistivity value and, and say that it's a semiconductor or a good or bad semiconductor or a good metal, right? See, look, unless you do this measurement as a function of temperature, you will not see that a drop, a, 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 a drop in resistivity happens all of a sudden, leading to the fact that, yes, it is indeed a, a superconducting transition. Is it not? So you need rho measurement as a function of temperature. Similarly, when you look at uh, different magnetic systems, see, in, 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 uh, I, I can categorize materials based on their electrical properties as, as uh, good conductors, semiconductors, metals. These three are three typical categories. But between metals and semiconductors, I also have semi-metals. Then beyond um, um, metals, I have superconductors. So five different categories. How do I distinguish one from the other? The best possible way of doing that is I need to measure resistivity as a function of temperature. Without that, you can't, you, you, you can't get complete information about the material. You can't, you can't apply standard theories. Even though we know that electrons, and electrons are carriers of uh, uh, charge in, 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 in metals and alloys, right? In semiconductors, the, the, the charge transport happens with the aid of uh, electrons and holes, right? There are several scattering mechanisms that you need to look into in order to explain the conduction property. See, you may have, uh, you may have the same superconducting transition with, uh, let's say, this is also a superconducting transition. This is a sharp transition and you may get Something like that. See, the normal state is different from the normal state of this. So to analyze all these behaviors, you must have the, all the data of, of Rho versus T. In a similar way, if I'm looking at the magnetic systems, right? What are the different types of magnetic uh, systems that are known? Like I, I named five categories uh, based on their electrical properties. In a similar way, I have one parameter that I can measure, that is susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, based on which I can distinguish between paramagnetism, diamagnetism, ferromagnetism, ferrimagnetism, and antiferromagnetism. Five different categories, just with one parameter. But then, this one parameter has to be measured as a function of temperature all the time, in a similar way that you do, without which you get no information. You will not be able to understand the theory behind how to distinguish between different types of magnetic systems. So, so in condensed matter physics, you know, temperature vari variation of measurements plays such a crucial role. So going back to this, uh, the BCS theory, uh, which was valid for almost, uh, yeah, close to five decades. That means uh, for five decades, there was no material that showed superconductivity more than this temperature. But all of a sudden, after that, in 1986, this unconventional material, yttrium barium copper oxide, showed a drop at 90 Kelvin. That's why, so, so the great field of HTSE was born, high temperature superconductivity. Why it is called high temperature superconductivity? 
of course, even till date, even after 30 years of this discovery from 1986, we still do not have a room temperature superconductor. Ideally, um, we need room temperature superconductors that would uh, uh, solve many uh, uh, power issues and, and would be useful in many devices, but we don't still have a superconductor at room temperature. But why they call high temperature superconductors is because we can the operating temperatures of uh, these superconductors is above liquid nitrogen temperature, right? And what is the liquid nitrogen uh, boiling temperature? 77 Kelvin. Yeah? So that means for me to do, the, do an experiment on, the, on thin film of NB3V, vanadium, I need to cool it down to this lowest temperature, I need uh, uh, liquid helium, which is production of liquid helium is not easy at all. And helium gas today is also very expensive. Of course, in IIT Madras, we have, uh, uh, we are the first, uh, uh, you know, labs, the low temperature physics lab is uh, well known in the country where we have uh, 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 liquid uh, liquefiers to get liquid helium and uh, liquid nitrogen, but liquid helium is a very expensive process. So the easiest is always to deal with uh, liquid nitrogen, right? Okay, now that, that's what it is. So, the, so the, what happened in 1986 was a revolution because bang, we got a material that uh, showed superconductivity at, at, at 77 Kelvin, uh, above 77 Kelvin, that is 90K, uh, much above 77 Kelvin. So you can easily cool this material and do all the experiments. Then the question is, when all these millions of uh, dollars and rupees are invested on basic research, the questions are, okay, from fundamental point of view, this is all fine. You can talk about the uh, validity of BCS theory in the bulk form of these high TC materials in the, in the, in the uh, single crystal form and thin film form then you apply all these theoretical models, but then what comes out in, form, in the form of applications? And the question is, unless you have a room temperature superconductor, how can I uh, uh, use anything in, in applications? So you see, when, when uh, uh, this material was invented, it was thought that you can easily make, uh, uh, you know, superconducting wires, and imagine if I if I manage to make this superconducting wires, you see the power that is generated uh, in the in the Kalpakam nuclear power plant. By the time it comes to Chennai city, 48 uh, 50 kilometers, 30 percent of the power is lost in the form of uh, I square or heating, right? You know that. Now imagine if it is traveling long longer distances. So this is always an issue. The power that is generated at the power station, 30 40 percent is always lost. And imagine the cost that goes into making uh, generate the power and, and, and these uh, power losses. So there are always uh, scientists and engineers working towards getting a room temperature superconductor. So imagine if, if these power cables are room temperature superconductors with a transition temperature at this point, and which means I can, I can use them as a cable where the power is transmitted without any I square or loss. You, the saving that 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 thirty percent or forty percent is very crucial. But then, when when this material was discovered, yttrium barium copper oxide, it was thought that when estimates were made, oh, I can make a forty kilometer long cable using this material, um, or even a thin film strip, a large number of thin strips of them, uh, laminates uh, combined together. Uh, and and then, if you look at the cost effectiveness, cooling this forty kilometer long wire to uh, uh, transport power is much cheaper, even though uh, the cooling process using liquid nitrogen is uh, involved because liquid nitrogen can be produced at a very uh, uh, you know, cheaper rate than losing the 30% using the normal cables. So that was, uh, 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 people, all the scientists were so happy that, yeah, now we can make uh, superconducting wires and superconducting uh, uh, thin films. Uh, you know, uh, that can carry this uh, uh, current, you know, current strips. 
but it was a immediately when uh, single crystals of uh, yttrium barium copper oxide were made and also thin films were grown no even before the thin film growth since it's a ceramic it forms in in polycrystalline form i'll i'll come in the next tomorrow's class it will be more clear uh, what i'm saying today so when i when when you obtain this material yttrium barium copper oxide it comes in polycrystalline form polycrystalline form that means the material has large number of crystallites separated by unwanted regions so that's a property of a ceramic ceramic readily forms in in a polycrystalline form converting it into a single crystal is it's it's expensive and not easy okay and it was found that in ceramic form even though it shows a a a, a nice uh, superconducting drop at 90 kelvin right the polycrystalline form that showed 90 kelvin uh, superconducting drop but only showed a current density which is j of the order of only 10 raised to 2 amperes per centimeter square this was a big disappointment it was a shock for the scientific community no one understood why the uh, you know basically why the current density has to be so low you know why if i have a normal wire made of copper or aluminum which is used for household purposes of course aluminum is uh, inexpensive compared to copper so most of the wiring is uh, by aluminum you know that yeah now you know the current carrying cap capacity so the bulb that is uh, lit up above me when i turn the switch on the wire is carrying uh, uh, the current density of the wire is anywhere from 10 to 4 to 10 to 5 amperes per centimeter square now you see what i mentioned here is uh, what did i say how many uh, so the, the the current density here i'm just trying to take a screenshot of the people who are present here just a minute but done so compared to this current density of metallic copper or aluminum that you know the current density is uh, tends to 4 to 5 amperes per centimeter square the current density of this superconducting system that means yttrium barium copper oxide which becomes a superconductor where from 90k and below the current flows through it without any hindrance without any resistance drop that is a, that is the meaning of a superconductor right but it shows a current density of just 100 amperes per centimeter square which means it cannot be used as a current carrying cable you know this is a, a huge disappointment for the scientific community but that's how research goes on today yttrium uh, yttrium barium copper oxide and bismuth uh, uh, cuprate superconductors are used in making superconducting wires because this problem was solved in one way and yttrium barium copper oxide superconductors in thin film form right where the current density problem is solved you know most of the mobile phone base stations use uh, these superconducting thin films which are of course cooled down to those temperatures the technological uh, uh, applications of these superconducting films even though the the transition temperatures are still low is unbelievable okay yeah? um, and uh, in microwave uh, circuits in space applications everywhere the system is there right even though still the uh, th that means if i i, I make a, a a a microwave uh, uh, device using yttrium barium copper oxide right but it has to be in a thin film form for me to envisage applications But, but then those devices have to be cooled down to those temperatures to make because uh, you know uh, these systems used in 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 space uh, already natural cooling is there it's it's not an issue but even uh, on the ground station um, uh, the mobile uh, phone uh, uh, server otherwise all these 
billions of uh, uh, you know bandwidths are not possible to cater to so many uh, mobile users. This is one of the major components there. You see how um, a, a, a simple material like uh, itrium barium copper oxide is so useful for in many many applications. So we'll as as we progress, you we we will see how this problem of low, you know, current density has been uh, addressed and how it is solved when you get the, the same ceramic in a thin film or a single crystalline form, you'll understand as we progress. But basically, I thought, uh, you know, you, 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 you need to understand first about polycrystallinity, single crystallinity, and uh, amorphous nature, which you will see in a more clear way in tomorrow's class, next class rather. So the next class could be um, again on Wednesday, probably we'll meet on Wednesday. Uh, if I'm not sen sending you a link for Wednesday, we'll, uh, we will... Um